Okay, um, well, I think we'll start now. So, welcome everyone to Centre of the Cell's Big Question Lecture. Um, welcome back to those of you who've been here before, and welcome if you've never been to a Centre of the Cell event before. So, we run these lectures once or twice a year, normally, um, and the last one we had was Surprise, Surprise in March 2020. Just to tell you a little bit about Centre of the Cell, if you don't already know, um, we are an informal science learning centre. We were the first science centre ever to be built inside a working research laboratory. And we've now had over 219,000 participants in our activities. And we run, some of you may have been to our STEM pod, a very immersive theatrical experience about cell biology and cell research. And then we have a whole series of uh, science shows, and we also have our youth member scheme, and it's lovely to see some of our youth members here tonight. And so that's a welcome for me. I should have said my name's Fran Borkel. I'm director of Centre of the Cell. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, and I hope you enjoy uh, this evening's lecture. And I'm going to hand over to Miffy, uh, one of our learning and outreach officers, who's going to introduce the lecture. Thank you, Fran. Uh, so, once again, just hello, everyone. Welcome to our Big Question Lecture. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, Fran already gave you a little bit of an introduction, but I did just want to add that this lecture has been co-created by, by Dr. Abigail Whitehouse and some of our youth members. I was actually wondering if anyone who's part of our youth membership scheme would just mind standing up and giving us a little wave just so we can see how many of you are here tonight, if any. Come on guys, I know there's some of you. Thank you very much. <laughs> there you go, you got a clap. Fantastic. Um, so before we begin, I do just need to inform you there are no fire alarm tests scheduled tonight. So if there is a fire alarm, it is a real one. Um, please follow myself or any of our staff in the blue hoodies. We will take you to the fire safety point. Could you also please make sure not to leave any coats or bags in sort of the aisle ways because they do create a trip hazard. Um, so today, Dr. Abigail Whitehouse, or Dr. Abby, will be showing us the impacts of air pollution on lung development. I'm not going to spoil what's coming up in the lecture as I have had a sneak peek and it's very excited, uh, exciting and very much looking forward to more of it. Um, but just to give you a bit of background, Dr. Abby studied medicine at the University of Manchester. She graduated in 2008, working initially in Greater Manchester as a foundation doctor and then moving to London for paediatrics training in 2010. She then went on to receive her PhD in paediatrics on the mechanism behind air pollution's health effects in children and is currently a researcher and NIHR clinical lecturer at Queen Mary. Dr. Abby is currently researching ways to reduce wheezing and asthma in young children and continuing her work on air pollution. Additionally, she works a lot with the community, the charity groups and primary care projects to reduce the impact of air or air pollution exposure. Uh, also, if you put anything, so that's a little introduction to Dr. Abby. Um, if you do put anything on social media tonight, please make sure to tag us uh, and use our hashtags. You can see up on the board, we are at Centre of the Cell, uh, and our hashtag is hashtag big question lecture. So, on that note, I will hand over to Dr. Abby. Once again, thank you for coming, everyone, and I really hope you enjoy it. My name is Abby Whitehouse. I'm a paediatric doctor and a clinical researcher here at Queen Mary's. Um, I have got some slides from Mentimeter, um, so if you can log into that now, the code will come up in a few slides' time. So it's menti.com. If you put the code in when I, we get to my slides, hopefully, fingers crossed, it will work. So, um, what we wanted to talk about today is is the air we breathe our hidden enemy? If we take a picture of a nice London street, Lots of cars, some green greenery, some blue sky. Doesn't look too terrible, quite a few cars, 
Not too many pedestrians. I mean, it's nothing like this, is it? This is 1952, the great smog of London. Four days, London brought to a complete standstill. Couldn't see more than about two foot in front of your face. And about 400 people died in that because of that four days of really bad smog. So probably what we should be thinking about when we're wandering around London, in particular, or our other cities around the country, is that the air looks like this around us. It's not there right in front of us, but this is what we need to be thinking, and this is what we need to be planning for in the future. If you look at the media, this is just a selection of things that came out over the last three weeks. Um, so air pollution exposure disparities across US populations, it, it significantly affects uh, the children that are coming from the poorest homes. So we need to be thinking about that. Air pollution stopping insects, bees, that's the latest research. So we're now peeling off our bees because we're polluting the air too much. A new one on me, tumble dryers found to be a cause of air pollution. That's the microfibers that are coming out. Uh, and then more worrying, toxic air pollution around every London hospital. We know it's around our schools, it's also around our hospitals. Think about who's going to those hospitals and who is going to be the most affected by the fact that they're walking into these areas. And one that I always like to bring up is the wood burners. And they do make your house smell lovely, um, and they do make it nice and warm, but they're definitely not good for the community. But actually, the media is doing some pretty good things now. Very different to when I first started doing research into air pollution about seven or eight years ago, when we didn't really talk about it very much at all. But actually, they're now starting to talk about it a lot more. In particular, what can we do, and what can cities do? What can motorists do? Hong Kong are now fixing cars to make sure that their emissions are better, and Londoners are being told what days are bad to go outside. I'll come back to that, because I'm not sure whether I agree with that advice. So what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to do the what's, the how's, the why's, and the where's of air pollution, and then we're going to come back to some more what's at the end about what we can do to help with it. Okay? So, if we start with what. Here's your first Mentimeter slide. So, what is air pollution? When I say the words air pollution to you, what do you think of? Hopefully, fingers crossed, this will work. Are you getting the screen up? Does it ask you for the answers? No? <laughs> okay. In which case, we're going to have to interact with each other instead of the screen. Sorry about that, but it's probably better for us. Okay. What do we think when we say air pollution? Anybody? What did you just type into your phones? Visual particulates. Okay. Anything else? Microparticles. Microparticles, yeah. Anything else? Lung disease. Okay. So particulate matter. And then the other thing you'll hear quite often is nitrogen dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone, and sulfur dioxide. All different gases. But let's take it to particulate matter first. So particulate matter looks a bit like this at the top if you really went down and do a nice electron microscope. It's really, really small. It's got a carbon core. And it's surrounded by other compounds, nitrites, nitrogen dioxide, it, all to do with processes in the air. And where we find that it's mainly coming from is what we expect, and that's road traffic and industrial processes. If we think about nitrogen dioxide, then the primary source of nitrogen dioxide is 
from diesel vehicles. Okay, it's from our trucks, it's from our buses, it's from our taxis, it's from anything that's pumping out diesel. And you can see over the last 60 or 70 years how much our car use has gone up. I mean, we didn't really use them 100 years ago, and then suddenly everybody's got one and everyone needs one to go to different places. Well, what happened about two years ago, we had something called a lockdown. It was a proper lockdown. It was a place where nobody went into central London, nobody went into the cities because everybody stayed home. And when they did, this is what happened to our nitrogen dioxide levels across all the different countries in Europe. It plummeted. In Paris, it plummeted below the WHO guidelines, as it did in Madrid. We almost got there in London, but not quite. But what happened a few months later? We all started to go back to work, we all started using our cars again, and unfortunately, the levels went back to normal. What we didn't see in this time was a drop in particulate matter. And the reason for that is because lots of other sources um, account for that, including things like Sahara and dust clouds. This, has anyone seen one of these maps before? Yeah? So this map on the left is available from the London Air Quality um, toolkit, which is online, and it gives you a map for London. And if you have a look at that, what you can see is you've got the red is the bad bits, and the blue is the good bits, and you can see the red basically shows you where all the roads are, and then there's this thing over on the left-hand side. Any ideas what that is? Airport. Yeah, Heathrow Airport. Actually, it doesn't look too bad in that one. I think it's not quite caught, cool, but you can see that all those main big roads where you all sit in traffic jams just cause large amounts of pollution. And this is our PM 2.5 levels. There's lots of websites that you can go on these days that pick up on the monitors that are all over the country. Um, and this is one of them, so smart air filters. And you can see the red line on this one, which is the WHO guidelines. And you can see how often we're going over the top of it, pretty much most states. We also have to think about other sources of air pollution. So quite often we think about air pollution as being just an outside problem. It's not, it's actually an inside problem as well. The things that we don't always think about as being pollutants are things like smoke and chemicals, carbon monoxide. What about your roast dinners and your toast and your wood burners again, okay? So every, anything that's making particles within the home is also contributing to your indoor air pollution. So we've talked a bit about what air pollution is, and that's quite straightforward. I've got another Mentimeter slide here that's not going to work, so I'm going to ask you a question again. So, how does air pollution affect us? Any ideas? What does it do to us? What conditions have you heard of that it makes worse? Asthma? Yeah, anything else? COPD. COPD, yeah? Any? Lots of them there. Anything else, guys? Dementia. Dementia. Well, you, you cheated. I put that on the first time. <laughs> Anything else? Skin conditions. Hmm? Skin conditions. Skin conditions. Yeah. So skin conditions because of contact. Any other ones? It makes a depression. Isn't it? it has been linked to depression as well. I'm going to come back to it. Cancer. Cancer. Unfortunately, but yes. Actually, it causes quite a lot of problems. And what I like to think about when I'm thinking about how it affects the body, is to take us through. Because we know that it takes us all the way from when, before we're born, until, unfortunately, the end of our lives. We're going to be affected by the pollution around us. If we think about babies, you get babies with smaller heads, and they're born smaller. You get problems when you're a bit older with developmental problems, including autism, and it's been linked to air pollution levels. More wheezing, more coughs, more infections. And this thing about lung function, You'll hear lots about lung function. We talk about it a lot when we think about um, air pollution. Asthma and the start of atherosclerosis. What's atherosclerosis? Mm. Full of, getting full of junk and it leads to strokes as an adult. So we have to think about that as well. So I'm going to take you through some of the research that's been done over the years. And a lot of our research around air pollution comes from what we call cohort studies. So big, large-scale cohort studies that either recruit children, babies, or adults. And this means that they follow them through, and they follow them through a certain period of time. And it gives us a lot of large-scale epidemiological data. 
So, for example, this one, the ESCAPE cohort study. So that was actually 14 separate cohort studies across Europe. And they pulled all this data together to look for what they wanted to find out. And in particular, they wanted to know about earthquakes. And they found that each rise of 5 micrograms per meter cubed in PM2.5 was associated with an increased risk of having low birth weight at time. So low birth weight, when they say that, they mean that's significantly low birth weight. So we're not talking just a few grams here or there. We're talking about babies that might be at risk of other problems because of this. And if you remember back to that graph that I showed you about how often we go over the WHO limits by more than 20, that's probably quite a big thing. But there is scope for improvement. There's a lot of natural or large-scale experiments that happen normally at this time of year around the Olympics. So in Beijing for the Olympics, which was a long time ago now, they basically banned all cars from the city, from the city of Beijing for the whole of the Olympics. Completely, they said, no, no one's coming into the city. And what that did was dramatically lower their um, pollution levels for a short period of time. And they then went back and they looked and they said, OK, so the women that were pregnant at that time how big were their babies when they were born? And they found that the women that were uh, pregnant in their eighth month, eighth week, uh, eighth month of pregnancy, they were going to have slightly bigger babies. So there's some improvement. I'm going to talk about lung function now, but I know that not everyone will know what lung function is. Can I have a show of hands if you know what I mean by lung function? Okay. Okay, good. In which case, I'm going to show you this video. It's very brief. Jane, does the lung function test. There was a mouthpiece for me to breathe into and a nose piece to stop it coming out of my nose during the test. For this test, I needed to start by breathing normally into the mouthpiece. Then, when Liam told me to, I had to take a big breath in and then breathe all the air out as fast as I could. It goes on for quite a lot longer, but I'll cut it there. But so, what this shows is something called FEV1. So what we're looking for when we call it FEV1. So it's forced expiratory volume in one second. So it's how much air can I get out of my lungs in that first second of blowing out of it. And this is a really good marker of our lung health and our lung growth. And also is a marker of obstructive lung disease in asthma. So if you've got asthma, your FEV1 will be reduced. But we use it as a marker of lung health, and we use it quite a lot in research studies, including, um, including this very large study in America, which was called the Children's Health Study in California. And what they did is they went and looked at multiple cities around California, and they plotted their exposure to elemental carbon, just back from 2004, so it's before we started really measuring particulate matter. And they plotted the percentage of children that had lower lung function. So our, our clinical cutoff is 80% of what we expect. So you can see that the higher the levels of carbon, the more children that had worse lung function. But what California then went and did was this. They managed between 95 and 2010 to halve their pollution levels. In fact, more than halve in some cities. Okay? And as expected, or as hoped, as the air pollution declined, so did the number of children that had clinically low lung function, which is good. What we don't know is if you were born at a certain time, if your lung function got better. The reason I talk about that is because when we think about lung function development, we get this curve. You can see right on the left-hand side with the dotted line, that's when you're in the womb and you're a baby. And then you've got this red line, which is childhood. Your lungs are growing slowly at that point. And then you have this massive jump when you're an adolescent, so between the age of 10 and 20, your lung function increases, and then you hit this nice peak and plateau. And then unfortunately, it's all downhill from there on. But the problem I have is that if you knock something off on that, and you, you have an impact either when you're being born, or in childhood, or more importantly in that adolescence phase, you never get your peak lung function. So your decline is going to be faster and to a lower level which means that things like COPD and lung disease as an adult are more significant. We tried to repeat this in London with the low emission zone study. So the LES came in 
a while ago, and it was the first initiative to try and reduce pollution levels in London. They did have modest reductions in nitrogen dioxide at the roadside and background levels. However, they, only, they found no real improvement in lung function at all over that time, or the percentage of children that had low lung function. So now, we're on the ULES study, which is much bigger, it's a much bigger area that it's covering. In fact, most people who live in London are probably affected by it now. However, it's a bit unfair on those groups that I spoke about briefly at the beginning, those socioeconomic groups, those ones, the groups that can't move because they can't move to the countryside, they can't buy a new car, and they can't buy something that isn't polluting. So they're still going to be affected, and they're going to be financially affected by the fact that we've said that we're not going to have these high pollution levels anymore. So we just have to think about it. But hopefully, we'll see some results from that study soon. This is something called a meta-analysis. So it takes, again, a bit like those cohort studies, it brings together all the results from several studies, and we're looking at asthma and wheat. And if you can see the line in the middle, that's no, no choice either way. And if the study suggests that it's going to be a risk factor, we're over to the right, and if it's going to be protective, it's over to the left. And as you can see, pretty much every study, apart from a couple, are over to the right, saying that particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide are associated with asthma and wheeze. And the reason that is important is because of this young lady here. So this is Ella Adukissi Deborah. She was a young girl who lived in Lewisham in South London, and she died from complications of an asthma attack several years ago. Does anybody know why she's important? This, this coroner person, they did something amazing. They said, you know what, at this inquest, I'm going to say that our air pollution did contribute to her death. They had multiple people that went as expert witnesses and they talked about the impact of air pollution on her. And she was the first child, the first person to have air pollution as a contributing factor on her death certificate. And that's due to her mum, who is an absolutely amazing advocate for her. And you'll see her all over the news and all over the um, community groups really fighting for better air for our children. So whenever I think about the implications of air pollution when it comes to asthma and weed, I remember Ella's smiling face. Because we can see even short-term effects. Anyone any ideas, any ideas where this is? Oxford Street. Yes, it's that wonderful place that we all love to go shopping. Maybe not so much anymore. Um, but certainly we used to really love to go shopping down there. It's really busy and all the tourists like to go there. So what they, this group did at Oxford is they took a selection of adult asthmatics and they walked them down Oxford Street and they did their lung function straight after and several hours after. And then they walked them through Hyde Park, which is nice and green, and they did their lung function again. And so you can see the white dots are the, uh, when they walked through Hyde Park and the black dots are when they walked down Oxford Street. And it's, this takes you all the way up to seven hours to 22 hours after exposure. And you can see this significant reduction in lung function after work, walking down um, Oxford Street. And this lasts all the way to 22 hours when they stopped recording results. So think about it exacerbating asthma attacks at that point. We also know that air pollution is associated with infection. Yet another of my meta-analyses that I've found. This one is from multiple studies in Africa that looked at the risk of pneumonia in children. And you can see everything's off to the right. They are all associated with an increased risk of pneumonia in children. So much so that this study was carried out. And this is called the CAP study. And this was a group of uh, researchers that went out to Malawi and they provided cleaner burning cook stoves. Because in Malawi in particular, a lot of the cooking in the villages is done in cooking huts, on wood burn, on fire mass fuel stoves, lots of smoke. Um, this is the inside one, but there's indoor ones, and children would sit in there with their parents as well. And what they went out to do was to see if they could reduce the number of children that had severe pneumonia. What they found was that they could reduce severe pneumonia, but not all pneumonia. So they've got more action to do. Adults are also affected. I'm a paediatrician, so I primarily talk about kids. 
but we know that the more interesting effects of air pollution are coming out now. So things like um, type 2 diabetes, heart attacks, lung cancer, um, an accelerated decline of your lung function, like I spoke about, but also things like dementia and Alzheimer's are associated with air pollution exposure. So, I'm now going to take you through the why, and this is where a lot of our research has been carried out. So particulate matter <coughs> makes it into your lungs, and depending on how small it is, depends on how far through your lungs it will get. And if we can get it all the way to the alveoli, right at the bottom, that's where it comes into contact with the rest of the body. And what we see is that the soot comes in and associated with oxidative stress, which is a chemical process, and some cell mediators, you get inflammation and immune deviation. And I'll come back and explain what that is. But I'm going to start with that first part. The soot. So these are examples of something that we've known about for a very long time. <coughs> on the left hand side you've got some nice healthy lungs and on the right hand side you've got smokers lungs. So smoking, bad, gives you black lungs. We did a study in Sao Paulo looking at the lungs of non-smokers. So right up on the left, on the left two on the left are non-smokers. So A and B a young ones, and then a C and D. But the ones on the left are non-smokers. And you can see that the ones on the left, on the bottom, have still got quite a lot of black in their lung surfaces. And that's the deposition of carbon just from being exposed to air pollution in South Africa. And they basically go around gobbling up all the bits that come into your lungs. And you, what you get here is you can see the black dots and that's where they've gobbled up bits of carbon. And what they demonstrated was that when you measured that, okay. when you measured that by using image analytics, that it was associated with the more carbon you had, the worse your lung function was, and the more you're exposed to, the higher it was in your lungs. So we said, okay, who else can we look at this for? What else can it tell us? So cyclists in London, cyclists have higher levels of black carbon because they're more exposed to pollution fumes. Pedestrians can walk away from that. And remember that study I talked about in Malawi? We went back and we looked at those women who'd had the new nice but cleaner burning cook stoves and we said, okay, does this work? Does this reduce how much black stuff you're breathing in? And yes, it seems to, but it's still massively higher than those of us that live in the UK. And that seems logical because we've got the air, it goes into our lungs, and it sits there, which is great. These macrophages come from placentas, so that's the bit feeding the baby. And you can see that there's black dots even in those. And this is work that Dr. Lee did for her PhD a couple of years ago. And you can see that that's managing, that means that those macrophages are travelling all the way to the placenta and potentially explaining some of those health effects on babies. And another group in Belgium did similar work and found that the more you're exposed to, the more you have in your placenta macrophages. But the next bit is the bit that's quite interesting and where we ran some big studies. So these are called dendritic cells. Has anyone heard of a dendritic cell before? Yes. Anyone know what that's? Go on. Interesting. Anybody else got an idea? Yeah, um, don't they grab pathogens with the dendrites and take them to places to be destroyed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So they sit there. This is the airway epithelium. They sit there with their dendrites, as you were demonstrating. And the dendrites pick up on anything that they come into contact with. They pull it inside them. They break it down. And they take it with them. And sometimes what it does is if, it, if they don't like it, or if it's new, then they become mature and they have markers on their surface that says that they're mature. And they take this stuff and they take it to T cells. And T cells are your white blood cells. And they say, look what I found, this is bad. What are you going to do about it? And the T cells then go, oh, actually you're right, that is bad. I'm going to do something about this. Well, the worrying thing is, is if you're exposed to air pollution, the risk is that you're going to move your normal response of T cells, which are responding to all those things that we expect them to, like bacteria and viruses, 
and they're going to move them and they're going to change slightly and they're going to be more likely to react to things that we probably didn't really want them to. And I'm talking about things like asthma and allergies and ATP. And they change and they're more likely to promote an asthma response. So if you take your nice immature DC, you can tell that I drew this one, it's not coming from a journal. <laughs> and if you've got nice, normal, immature DCs, they're not coming into contact with anything bad, they, they just regulate everything, they talk to the t regs and the, the, which are regulatory T cells that don't really, that are kind of controlling everything, and they don't do too much. But if you get them mature and you've exposed them to something bad, such as PM, they start to express something called CD86, which I'll come back to, and they then stimulate these T cells and white blood cells to have a different response. And we could see that in the lab. So we knew that if you gave dendritic cells some particulate matter, that they became more mature and they started to express CD86, which tells us that they're mature. And this happened, and this then had an effect on the T cells. So this is what we do in a microscope in a lab. We wanted to know if this was happening in real life. So we did something called the ACAP study. So airway fills and air pollution. And it was a really interesting study, and we combined work in the blizzard with Centre of the South. And that meant that we could go out into schools and do nice talks and education at the same time as the kids all gave me some lovely sputum samples. Um, so we got sputum samples, we did some lung function, we took some other tests, and we did some pollution monitoring. But it meant that we were getting kids that wouldn't necessarily have been exposed to research projects because these are healthy kids, these are kids that haven't got a medical problem. And so that was really good. We did some air pollution monitoring, which I'll come back to you. And then we looked at their macrophages. And then we did something called photoitometry, which looks at those cell markers and tells us what cells there are. We had schools across London. And what we found was that the majority were exposed to pollution levels that exceeded the WHO guidelines, but probably were just underneath the EU ones. And we split them into three groups. And so we split them into higher, middle, and lower levels of air pollution exposure. And we found that there was a difference, that your lung function was better if you attended one of the, lung, the lower polluted schools. And back to that CD86, we found that there were more cells expressing CD86 in the kids that were attending the higher polluted schools. So we were seeing more mature um, dendritic cells as them. And then the last bit that I talked about was impaired host defense. So if you put some pollution in a pot with some epithe um, airway epithelial cells and some bacteria, you find that the bacteria sticks more to the cells than they would do before, which probably increases your risk of air pollution related pneumonia. But when we said, I'm at where now. So where are we exposed? So pollution monitoring. This was one of our first studies. So Dr. Nakari did it. Um, and we looked, this is the cycling study again. And you can see where the peaks are through the day. They've got different peaks. And you can see that that cyclist seems to have higher peaks than the non-cyclist. And we found that the cyclists were more exposed on their commute because they're closer to the traffic. And then the non-cyclists are more exposed at home. So we then thought, OK, well, how does this work in kids? And you can see in children, this is black carbon monitoring. You can see that they have a peak on the journey home from school and the journey to school. And also breakfast, so that's probably that toaster going off. But also break time. And the reason for that is because schools are built next to main roads to make it easy and accessible for everyone to get to school. Um, unfortunately, that means your playground is also right next to a main road with all the cars. And we found that there was a disproportionate amount of black carbon being exposed in those times when we were commuting to school compared to the time that we were at home. So how can we use this information to make things better? Well, you could try walking a different route to or from school. There's some students did this work a couple of years for, to go for it, and they looked at a very windy side road walk and a main road walk, not very far from here. And they, could, they found that you could pretty much halve your pollution exposure by walking on side streets. But is that safe? Is that a good thing to do? Well, probably because it reduces your pollution exposure. But whether it's safe is another matter. And then we did a much bigger study looking at children 
and whether or not if we told people where they were exposed to air pollution, they would be able to do something about it. So we gave them some generic advice, so such as take a different route to school, this is where you're exposed, think about things in the home, what might you do there? And so and we found that actually the main place where we were able to alter exposure was in the home, so probably being exposed during cooking. Um, but we're hoping to recreate some of this soon. So, again, I had another Mentimeter slide to go next, so we're going to have to answer in real life. Um, what can we do? Has anybody heard of what thing? I've talked about a couple of things that you can do to reduce your pollution exposure. Anybody else got any ideas on how we can re reduce our own pollution exposure? Anything the media has told you to do? Buy electric cars. Buy oh, that one. Buy electric cars, yep. Yeah. Do you know what we are doing with cars in the UK? Um. <laughs> I think that might come in soon. Um, there is going to be a ban on all diesel and petrol cars being new ones uh, being sold in the UK in not too many years' time. So we have to be thinking about electric cars. Anything else? Move to the countryside. Move to the countryside. Yeah. Anecdotally, definitely works. Um, difficult to do a randomised control trial because you have to make everybody move. <laughs> I quite enjoy it, but then what if I was in the placebo group and I had to stay in London? Um, <laughs> but think about who that affects, though, doesn't it? Again, it comes back to that social disparity. So actually, if you're poorer, you're not going to be able to move away, are you? In the back. What about wearing face masks? Face masks, yes. Well, it was quite an innovative time, wasn't it, over the last two years? The first time many of us have worn a face mask. We actually were about to start a study just before the pandemic that looked at face masks like this. <laughs> Unfortunately, something else took over took us. Hopefully, we might look at it in the future. So the studies so far about face masks have shown have basically been done without that internal dose. So we don't know how much you're breathing in. So we can definitely put a face mask on and wander around and maybe put a monitor just inside and see how much is there. But it's quite difficult to assess how much is actually going in. So actually, face black carbon might be a way for us to know how that much is going in. We know that it definitely helps with bigger particles. We're not really sure otherwise. But it's definitely worth having a think about, especially now we're all a bit more used to wearing them. Any other ideas? I was hoping for something weird, weird and wonderful. Oh, like a raw veg diet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to convince the diet to help. Um, but maybe green walls or yeah. something like that. Yeah, what, what do green walls do? Exactly. So there's lots of ideas out there, and there's lots of things that have been promoted. But one of the main things that we've found is it's all around messaging. So this is a really interesting message that was sent out over Europe, which is about living along a busy road is the equivalent to smoking 10 cigarettes a day. So that's okay, that's fine. So let's all be house, it's not so easy. Or let's all close our windows well, then you're not ventilating your home. So it's quite difficult for you to make that decision. Hopefully, we're going to see some improvements when we get rid of our diesel fleet of cars, although, again, it's going to affect the people that can't afford to buy new ones. We've been doing work with simple messaging. So these are some of the things that we use in our clinic. This is some work that we designed. So keeping on those quieter roads away from main roads, trying to walk, cycle, and scoot more, even though you're more likely to be exposed when you are inside a car with the windows closed, it's actually still much, much healthier for you. And you can walk away from the pollution. Sign up to something like AirText. Has anyone heard of AirText? So AirText is a really simple device, it's been a, a simple um, app that's been around for a long time, but it gives you a little notification on your phone if the air pollution levels are high outside. So good for people who have a modifiable lifestyle. So, People that may be retired that don't go to work every day can obviously make a decision not to go out if they've got high pollution levels. Children who have to go to school, it's a bit more difficult, but there's definitely ways that we can use that information to help us. And that, that new story that I showed at the beginning about not exercising outside is quite a good one. Um, this is one of my big things, is idling <coughs> cars, turning them off. Where is the worst place for idling cars? Outside of schools. Yeah. So if you go and knock on all the windows as you walk past the school and turn their windows off the next time, that would be great. Um, and then thinking about in the home as well, so using fragrance-free and less chemicals, um, and thinking about 
using your extractor fan when you're cooking, you'd be amazed how much that actually gets rid of particles and opening windows so that you're ventilating your home. And the things that are coming next are coming to some of these. So the problem we've got at the moment is that lots of these things have been suggested, but nobody's told us how they work, how well they work. Some of them, they might tell us, yes, you can reduce the particle levels, you can reduce the pollution levels, but what impact does that have on health? So we have to have more, more research and more investigation on it. And green walls are one. Um, again, they possibly reduce the pollution levels in local areas, but not so much. This thing on the left is a bit um, futuristic, but that's one of the air purifiers that's out there. Again, expensive, probably going to help too much. Masks, as you said, at the back. Um, anybody know where the one on the right is from? At the top? Where do we have lots of bicycles in Europe? Amsterdam. So cycling streets, I love it in Amsterdam. You're more likely to get run over by a cyclist than you are to even see a car. Um, so, you know, and they, they, that's just their way of life. And we actually look like we might be getting slightly closer to it after the pandemic kind of settled down to start with, because there are all these extra cycling paths. And they've all kind of slowly disappeared again, which is a bit of a shame. And then car bans around school, I think is probably important. And this is the work that was done that looked at behavioural mod um, modification. And it is around heating and ventilation and behaviour from a personal perspective, but then also about much more bigger things, so like air quality standards and emission regulations. Getting closer to those WHO guidelines would be good, but also about urban planning and local travel networks, which are a very uh, controversial subject because they just move the pollution from one place to another. So they might improve it for some people. Fair. Okay. So I've taken you on a whistle stop tour of the, of the evidence behind air pollution's health effects, what it does, where it is, and how it affects us. I know that more is needed to reduce the levels and that it will have a positive impact on health. And that we should all be fighting for clean air. And it's really something that I want everybody to advocate for. And it's not just for us, it's for everybody that's younger than us that has to grow up in these polluted areas. And any little things that we can do and tell other people about are really important. And that's it for me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Abby. Um, we do now have some time for questions. So if anyone has any questions they would like to ask Dr. Abby, maybe about air. Oh, ooh, that was quick. Um, will you gonna come around this? Because I'm just gonna stand in the middle. <laughs> Talking to children about uh, the sort of thing going to school to get the volunteers, how do you broach this sort of topic, which is quite frightening, with kids without scaring them? How do you make it sound positive without being like you're going to grow up with really small lungs and it'll be terrible? <laughs> um, so we were really fortunate when we did the A class study that you guys, or your predecessors, came out and did this work with us. The Centre of the Cell worked with us um, so that we have a really nice package of messaging. And you're right, it's a scary subject, it is a motive. But actually, we found that the kids take it all on board, you give them the basics, they lead with it, and they are more than happy to take in that information. One of the really important things we found with the work that we did was that we went back to the school after a period of time and found out that they'd run whole education projects based off that one workshop that we went and did with them. And we were really pleased about that. And we, I mean, we used wonderful games. I don't think I've put a picture in, but we had the sputum splatter, which was a giant fact of green goo that we put all the cells in so that they knew what we were doing. Um, and actually, we just we were really truthful and we told them about it and we told them why we were doing it. And that's why the, the parents in particular were really keen for their kids to take part as well so that we could get more education out of it. Brilliant, thank you very much. Which school did you say that you went to? Hmm? Which schools? There are multiple schools across London. Yeah. I think we had 14 in the end that we went to. Uh, thank you. Well, I thought it was fascinating, slightly scary, but fascinating. Um, one thing that I really like is the fact that there's so much data that you use, so much evidence, and when it comes to informing the public, 
evidence is key, but you can't go into that level of detail that you've done tonight. When you say that the, this sort of thing is being reported more, it's being talked about more, what I'm interested in is how is it being talked about? In your opinion, is it scare stories? Is it accurate in terms of the science? Um, and are you having just headlines which are actually misleading? How do you feel that this is being reported? It's been really interesting actually. Over the years it's changed, and you're right. I, I must admit it depends on which media outlets you look at. There is a certain newspaper that likes to word, use the word lethal and toxic a lot in all their messaging. And the same story will be com reported completely differently elsewhere. The placental macrophages story was a really interesting one to see the media's response to. So they, as I said, one newspaper said, toxic particles found in placentas impact on babies. And you're like, oh gosh, that's really scary. And then someone else, someone else said, um, in a much nicer way. And actually, if you looked, one of them didn't really talk about the data at all, and one of them talked about the data in a lot more detail. And I think there's a lot more community groups out there now that are far more interested. Um, I know that some of them were tweeting about this, so Mums for Lungs and groups like that. And actually, they're giving you access and promoting looking at the actual research rather than just the jumpy, scare story about roastiness. Um, but any, 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 I think any media input is good, but we don't want to scare people too far away. Um, but it, anything that just, it definitely has changed and it's better than it was before. Just following on from that a little bit, so you mentioned earlier that like, behaviour change and messaging is quite important. I mean, what would your tactics for that kind of messaging be for us? I think it's about having really simple messages. It's about. It's also about if you're a clinician or uh, someone in authority, be understanding the data. So we've done some work with the WHO around informing education for clinicians. We've done work with the clinicians here at Arts Health about understanding air pollution so that they know so that they can then give good advice to their patients. But actually it's about having some nice simple messaging and simple actions. That's why I really like our set of things that we've said. Because they're simple, they're easy to do, and they're actionable for pretty much everybody. But they get that information, that background information as well. But there will be more conversations and more discussions as time goes on. <coughs> Thank you. You can hear me through the last yeah. Um, so I was um, really interested in two of the slides. One of them which showed the difference between those um, people who walk through Oxford Street and then walking through Hyde Park and the increased lung function after time spent in the Hyde Park. I'm wondering how that kind of data set matches onto this idea that if you um, are exposed at a young age, you might never get the lung function later on in life. So I'm wondering where, 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 if you could just speak a bit more about where the science is around being able to kind of repair your lungs um, by, I don't know, yeah, by doing kind of mitigating effects. And I speak as a father of three young children in, um, in London, one of whom seems to be developing kind of coughs and wheezes, while the other two seem to be absolutely like unaffected. So I'm interested in that. So one of the, yeah, it's, it's difficult. One of the really big issues when we talk about causality in research and in medicine is that it's really difficult to say, yes, this is what's caused this. But what we do know with asthma and wheeze is that if you are exposed to a certain trigger at some point in your formative years, so as a toddler normally, um, that you're more likely, and you're prone to asthma, so you might have a family history, then you're more likely to develop asthma. So if you were, for example, if two people twins were born who both had the same family history and one was brought up in central London and one was brought up in the countryside, then the one in the countryside is less likely to get asthma. But what we know is that repeated asthma and repeated wheezing decreases your lung function and stops you getting that attainment. That's probably where it fits there. But also that you're more likely to have asthma the more you're exposed. So it's a kind of a combination of short-term cumulative effects and it's long-term predisposition to asthma. Um, I would just suggest that you make sure you treat the weeds really well. Um, and plenty of time outside, away from main roads. I think we have time for one more. Up top there. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it was not very clear from the part, um, if the pollution uh, gives uh, a hyperactivation of the immune system and uh, maybe autoimmunity or on the 
contrary even there to the standard in the So some of the mechanisms are not the less um, well understood part, and that, that part that's really least understood is how we go from the dendritic cells to the T cells and that switch. But what we think is that if you are exposed to more air pollution, you've got more of these dendritic cells and they're promoting your T cells. And instead of them being the, t the white blood cells that you'd expect, and they just respond to normal things like bacteria and viral infections, they're the ones that start reacting to more things and so other triggers. And so just being exposed to air pollution can trigger that as well. So that's where we think that's probably happening. But it's one of the bits that's a lot more difficult to prove in, in real life. So we're coming to the end now, and I would like to thank everyone once again for joining us today. Um, we will have about half an hour now, we've got some refreshments outside, some drinks, some snacks. You will get a chance to sort of speak with us or speak with Dr. Abby if you wish, um, and to have a few nibbles. Once again, we did co-create this lecture with our youth membership scheme, so if there is anyone here who would like to join, uh, it's a free scheme for 14 to 19 year olds and it helps support them into healthcare or STEM-related careers. We do have some forms outside. You're more than welcome to ask us any questions and to sign up to that. Um, but for now, I, I would like you all to join me in giving Dr. Abby another big round of applause.